people are of infinite complexity, and you can spend a lifetime watching them without ever fully understanding them. So it is all the more important than to begin your education now in doing so, you must also keep one principle in mind never discriminate as to whom you study and whom you trust never trust anyone completely and study everyone, including friends and loved ones. Finally, you must learn always to take the indirect route to power disguise. You're cunning like a billiard ball that carms several times before it hits its target. Your moves must be planned and developed in the least obvious way. By training yourself to be indirect, you can thrive in the modern court, appearing at the paragon of decency while being the consummate manipulator. Consider the 48 Laws of Power, a kind of handbook on the arts of indirection. The laws are based on the writings of men and women who have studied and mastered the game of power. These writings span a period of more than 3,000 years and were created in civilizations as disparate as ancient China and Renaissance Italy. Yet they share common threads and themes together. Hinting at an essence of power that is yet to be fully articulated. The 48 laws of power are the distillation of this accumulated wisdom gathered from the writings of the most illustrious strategists, statesmen, courtiers, seducers and con artists in history. They have a simple premise action. Almost always increase one's power. The observance of the law, while others decrease it and even ruin us. The transgression of the law These transgressions and observances are illustrated by historical examples. The laws are timeless and definitive The 48 laws of power can be used in several ways by listening to this program straight through. You can learn about power in general, although several of the laws may seem not to pertain directly to your life and time, you will probably find that all of them have some application and that in fact they are interrelated by getting an overview of the entire subject. You will best be able to evaluate your own past actions and gain a greater degree of control over your immediate affair. The program can also be picked apart for entertainment for an enjoyable ride through the foibles and great deeds of our predecessors in power. A warning, however, to those who use the program for this purpose, it might be better to turn back to endlessly seductive and deceptive in its own way. It is a labyrinth, your mind becomes consumed with solving its infinite problems, and you soon realize how pleasantly lost you have become. In other words, it becomes most amusing by taking it seriously. Do not be frivolous with such a critical matter. The gods of power frown on the frivolous they give ultimate satisfaction only to those who study and reflect and punish those who skin the surfaces looking for a good time. Law 1 Never outshine the master judgment always. Make those above you feel comfortably superior in your desire to please and impress them. Do not go too far in displaying your talents, or you might accomplish the opposite. Inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are, and you will attain the heights of power transgression of the law, Nicolas Fouquet. Louis Xi's finance minister in the first years of his reign was a generous man who loved lavish parties. Pretty women and poetry. He also loved money, for he led an extravagant lifestyle. Fouquet was clever and very much indispensable to the king. So when the prime minister, July Mazura, died in 16 and 61 the finance minister expected to be named the success. Instead the king decided to abolish the position this and other signs made food cases spec that he was falling out of favor and so he decided to ingratiate himself with the king by staging the most spectacular party the world had ever seen. The party's ostensible purpose would be to commemorate the completion of Fouquet's chateau, Vola Vicom, but its real function was to pay tribute to the king, the guest of honor, the most brilliant nobility of Europe and some of the greatest minds of the time La Fontaine, Lavroche, Madame de Sabignier, attended the party. Moliere wrote a play for the occasion in which he himself was to perform at the evening's conclusion. The party began with a lavish seven-course dinner featuring foods from the Orient never before tasted in France, as well as new dishes created, especially for the night. The meal was accompanied with music commissioned by Fouquet to honor the king. After dinner, there was a promenade through the chateau's gardens, the grounds and fountains of Volvican were to be the inspiration for Versailles Fouquet personally accompanied the young king through the geometrically aligned arrangements of shrubbery and flowerbeds, arriving at the garden's canals. They witnessed a fireworks display which was followed by the performance of Moyer's play. The party ran well into the night, and everyone agreed it was the most amazing affair they had ever attended. The next day, Fouquet was arrested by the king's head musketeer, D'Artagnan. Three months later, he went on trial for stealing from the country's treasury actually, most of the stealing he was accused of. He had done on the king's behalf and with the king's permission, Fouquet was found guilty and sent to the most isolated prison in France, high in the Pyrenees Mountains, where he spent the last twenty years of his life in solitary confinement. Interpretation Louis XIV the Sun King was a proud and arrogant man who wanted to be the center of attention at all times. He could not countenance being outdone in lavishness by anyone, 
and certainly not as finance minister. To succeed Fouquet, Louis chose Jean-Baptiste Colbert, a man famous for his parsimony and for giving the dullest parties in Paris. Colbert made sure that any money liberated from the treasury went straight into Louis' hands with the money Louis built a palace even more magnificent than Foucault's the glorious Palace of Versailles. He used the same architects decorators and garden designer and at Versailles, Louis hosted parties even more extravagant than the one that cost Fouquet. He's freedom let us examine the situation. The evening of the party, as Fouquet presented spectacle on spectacle to Louis each more magnificent than the one before he imagined the affair as demonstrating his loyalty and devotion to the king. Not only did he think the party would put him back in the king's favor, he thought he would show his good taste, his connections and his popularity, making him indispensable to the king and demonstrating that he would make an excellent prime minister instead. However, each new spectacle, each appreciative smile, bestowed by the guests on Fouquet, made it seem to Louis that his own friends and subjects were more charmed by the finance minister than by the king himself. And that Fouquet was actually flaunting his wealth and power rather than flattering Louis XIV. Fouquet's elaborate party offended the king's vanity. Louis would not admit this to anyone, of course. Instead, he found the convenient excuse to rid himself of a man who had inadvertently made him feel insecure. Such is the fate in some form or other of all those who unbalance the master's sense of self, poke holes in his vanity, or make him doubt his preeminence. Observance of the law in the early 1600s the Italian astronomer and mathematician Galileo found himself in a precarious position. He depended on the generosity of great rulers to support his research and so, like all Renaissance scientists, he would sometimes make gifts of his inventions and discoveries to the leading patrons of the time once, for instance, he presented a military compass he had invented to the Duke of Gonzaga. Then he dedicated a book explaining the use of a compass to the Medici's. Both rulers were grateful and through them Galileo was able to find more students to teach, no matter how great the discovery. However, his patrons usually paid him with gifts, not cash. This made for a life of constant insecurity and dependence. There must be an easier way, he thought. Hit on a new strategy in 1610 when he discovered the moons of Jupiter. Instead of dividing the discovery among his patrons, giving one the telescope he had used dedicating a book to another, and so on, as he had done in the past, he decided to focus exclusively on the Medici's. He chose the Medici's for one reason. Shortly after Cosmo, the first had established the Medici dynasty in 1540. He had made Jupiter the mightiest of the gods the Menashe symbol, a symbol of a power that went beyond politics and banking. One linked to ancient Rome and its divinities. Galileo turned his discovery of Jupiter's moons into a cosmic event honoring the Medici's greatness shortly after the discovery, he announced that the bright stars, the moons of Jupiter, offered themselves in the heavens to his telescope at the same time as Cosmo, the second's enthrallment. He said that the number of the moons, four, harmonize with the number of the Medici's. Cosmo the second had three brothers, and that the moons orbited Jupiter as these four suns revolved around Cosimo the first. The dynasty's founder more than coincidence. This showed that the heavens themselves reflected the ascendancy of the Medici family. After he dedicated the discovery to the Medici's, Galileo commissioned an emblem representing Jupiter sitting on a cloud with the four stars circling about him and presented this to Cosmo. The second as a symbol of his length to the stars in 1610 Cosimo II made Galileo his official court philosopher and mathematician with a full salary for a scientist. This was the coup of a lifetime, the days of begging for patronage were over. Interpretation in one stroke, Galileo gained more with his new strategy than he had in years of begging. The reason is simple. All masters want to appear more brilliant than other people the producer of a great work wants to feel he is more than just the provider of the financing. He wants to appear creative and powerful, and also more important than the work produced in his name instead of insecurity. You must give him glory. Galileo did not challenge the intellectual authority of the Medicis with his discovery, or make them feel inferior in any way by literally aligning them with the stars he made them shine brilliantly among the courts of Italy. He did not outshine the master. He made the master outshine all others. Keys to power when it comes to power outshining the master is perhaps the worst mistake of all. Do not fool yourself into thinking that life has changed much since the days of Louis XIV and the Medici's. Those who attain high standing in life are like kings and queens. They want to feel secure in their positions and superior to those around them in intelligence, wit, and charm. It is a deadly but common misperception to believe that by displaying and vaunting your gifts and talents, you are winning the master's affection. He may feign appreciation, but at his first opportunity he will replace you with someone less intelligent, less attractive, less threatening, just as Louis XIV replaced the sparkling Fouquet with the bland Colbert and as with Louis, 
he will not admit the truth, but will find an excuse to rid himself of your presence. This law involves two rules that you must realize. First, you can inadvertently outshine a master simply by being yourself. There are masters who are more insecure than others, monstrously insecure. You may naturally outshine them by your charm and grace no one had more natural talents than Astor Mount Freddy, Prince of Fahenza, the most handsome of all the young princes of Italy. He captivated his subjects with his generosity and open spirit in the years in the year 1500 Cesare Borgeria laid siege to Fienza. When the city surrendered, the citizens expected the worst from the crew of Borger, who, however, decided to spare the town. He simply occupied its fortress, executed none of its citizens, and allowed Prince Manfredi 18 at the time to remain with his court in complete freedom a few weeks later, though, soldiers hauled Astor Manfredi away to a Roman prison. A year after that, his body was fished out of the river Tiber, a stone tied around his neck. Borger justified the horrible deed with some sort of trumped-up charge of treason and conspiracy. But the real problem was that he was notoriously vain and insecure. The young man was outshining him without even trying, given Manfredi's natural talents the prince's mere presence made Borgia seem less attractive and charismatic. The lesson is simple. If you cannot help being charming and superior, you must learn to avoid such monsters of vanity. Either that or find a way to mute your good qualities when in the company of a Cesare Borgia second never imagine that because the master loves you, you can do anything you want. Entire books could be written about favorites who fell out of favor by taking their status for granted, for daring to outshine knowing the dangers of outshining your master. You can turn this law to your advantage. First, you must flatter and puff up your master, overt flattery can be effective, but has its limits. It is too direct and obvious and looks bad to other courtiers discreet flattering is much more powerful. If you are more intelligent than your master, for example, seeing the opposite make him appear more intelligent than you act naive. Make it seem that you need his expertise commit harmless mistakes that will not hurt you in the long run, but will give you the chance to ask for his help. Masters adore such requests. A master who cannot bestow on you the gifts of his experience may direct rancor and ill will at you instead. If your idea is a more creative than your master's describe them to him in as public a matter as possible. Make it clear that your advice is merely an echo of his advice he must appear as the sun around which everyone revolves, radiating power and brilliance to center of attention. If you are thrust into the position of entertaining him, a display of your limited means may win you his sympathy. Any attempt to impress him with your grace and generosity can prove fatal. Learn from Fouquet or pay the price in all of these cases, it is not a weakness to disguise your strengths. If in the end they lead to power by letting others outshine you, you remain in control instead of being a victim of their insecurity. This will all come in handy the day you decide to rise above your inferior status if, like Galileo, you can make your master shine even more in the eyes of others than you are a godsend, and you will be instantly promoted.